Okay, it's now recording. So let me just say a couple of uh, announcements. This way we save some time for people who was lost with the link scales. So yeah, we are starting the second semester uh, of all of you. You can check on the web what the talks are gonna be. We will improve the web. <laughs> These mistakes should be <laughs> corrected. Uh, as usual, the, as usual, the, the talks are going to be on Tuesday and mostly at, at uh, 4 p.m. Central European time. <clears throat> uh, then about, yeah, this is also for you, Mark. Normally the talk is one hour, but we are pretty flexible with time. And there's a lot of freedom for people to ask questions. So just uh, whoever, whomever wants to, to ask a question, just uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. If there is too many questions or things are derailing, I will try to, moder try to moderate. <laughs> but uh, this is it. And just let me answer some of the organizers which are lost in, in Skype, like Navid. Who... <laughs> but OK, this, I, I guess we have. I think we have to start. So yeah, it's very nice. and. I'm very sorry about this, Mark. It's very nice to have Mark Messey from Stony Brook, who will tell us about this very interesting recent work of, of his and collaborators about police keeping and, uh, and chaos. So Mark, please go ahead. Thank you very much for the invitation and all of you for coming. And uh, let me reiterate that please ask questions, especially that we are uh, relatively, we have a relatively small audience today. So my title will be for skipping and related probes of uh, away from maximal chaos. And uh, this is work done uh, with Sharoshi, Choi, and I'll also be mentioning some uh, earlier work with Stanford, Wondershi, and Virueta. Okay, so as an introduction, uh, let me remind you that there are a variety of phenomena and signatures associated with quantum chaotic dynamics. The transport of conserved densities, here is diffusive transport. The thermalization starting from an out of equilibrium initial state. The quantum butterfly effect. The recently proposed pause skipping phenomena phenomenon, uh, which, is, so, which is proposed to be a signature of chaos, the growth of complexity of states and uh, of the time evolution operator. And historically, uh, the first signature of chaos uh, was investigated in the statistics of eigenvalues, energy eigenvalues. The ultimate goal of this research direction is to describe these phenomena in a unified theory. That's extremely ambitious. Our goal today, or my goal in, in my research, is to develop effective field theories valid at long distances and late times for some of these processes, and to study their interplay and uh, their relation to gravity through ADS CFT. So today I'll mostly be focusing on pause skipping, uh, but to put things in context, I'll start discussing uh, uh, transport. Uh, some results about the butterfly effect, and in the end, we will also talk about thermalization uh, to discuss some uh, relations between these phenomena that are emerging. And an overarching theme of the talk will be an attempt to go away from infinite coupling or maximal chaos, where things are relatively better understood. Okay, so as a warm up and to put everybody on the same page. Let me briefly go over um, one formulation of hydrodynamics, uh, which is an extremely uh, strong and universal uh, description of transport of conserved densities in all chaotic systems. The main physical idea behind it is that at finite temperature, we expect that most excitations relax uh, in, in a characteristic time, local equilibration time, which in strongly coupled systems uh, is expected to go with beta. If you, if you have a weakly coupled system, then this beta can uh, be divided by a small coupling constant g, g squared, 
Um, and uh, even in those systems, if you wait long enough, the system will eventually equilibrate. Um, now, uh, in, in the regime where we take wavelengths uh, uh, very long, so p times uh, t log uh, is a lot smaller than one, in this dynamical regime, the dynamics of conserved densities become slow. Uh, they are approximately conserved. Um, okay, so the next step um, is to uh, re is to think of hydrodynamics uh, as an EFT uh, valid at long distance uh, as a systematic expansion and long distances and late times. And the key key uh, mathematical step is to rewrite the stress tensor. Uh, in terms of fluid variables. So the energy density, pressure, and the four velocity. And here I wrote down explicitly the zeroth order in gradient terms, and I grouped the higher order in gradient terms in this tensor phi. Uh, and then the dynamics uh, follows from the conservation of the stress tensor. If we linearize around the equilibrium configuration, we can easily determine uh, Green's functions. Uh, this is the Green's function that you get in hydrodynamics for the energy density. Uh, you see a sound mode that is linearly dispersing and has a small uh, decay width. Hydrodynamics is not just about the conserved densities. In this effective field theory, you can rewrite any microscopic operator, any operator in the microscopic theory of spin L, this OL. Uh, as, as expressed uh, through the stress tensor. So in this case, uh, we act with uh, L minus two derivatives on the stress tensor. Here I'm not writing in indices. This is a, just schematic and there are some uh, coefficients which are not determined from EFT reasoning, have, have to be determined for matching to the uh, UV theory. And so this would be the leading term. And then there are also polynomials in the stress tensor. And you have to write down any combination that, uh, that is allowed by symmetry. And uh, if we want to calculate correlation functions of this microscopic operator, what we do is simply do this replacement, uh, use these Green's functions, uh, and we get the systematic long distance late time expression. Okay. Now I talked about hydrodynamics here, but in this talk we will also will also be interested in uh, systems which do not conserve momentum, and in that case uh, the Green's function of the energy density uh, takes this diffusive form. So let me now uh, discuss uh, the pores of the, of these Green's functions. So let's see. So the dispersion relation of the pole in hydrodynamics, uh, as we said, is a linearly dispersing sound mode. Um, and in systems without momentum conservation, uh, we get a pure imaginary uh, pole on the lower half plane, uh, which is dispersing quadratically. Um, it would be really nice to compute uh, this Green's function uh, in a microscopic theory by which I mean uh, to get an expression that is valid for all omega and p. If we had that, uh, we could follow the fate of these poles uh, away from the hydrodynamic regime to, uh, to momenta that are order one uh, in, in this local thermalization uh, time scale. And we would be able to read off all order transport coefficients from such an expression. And this is exactly what we will do when discussing pole skipping. A landmark achievement of ADS-CFT was to compute such a finite temperature correlator at infinite Toft coupling in uh, super young maze theory uh, by solving differential equations numerically. Uh, in some sense, uh, we will do even better in, in the SYK model. Um, and uh, just a comment on, uh, on philosophy. Uh, so one can imagine an alternative history in which hydrodynamics was not known, and string theory studying uh, uh, bumpy ADS black holes through the fluid gravity correspondence discover uh, some uh, laws that govern transport in super young Mills theory. Uh, and uh, a key step would have been to realize that uh, this theory is formulated in variables that are uh, appropriate for any 
chaotic system. And the bold conjecture could have been that hydrodynamics that was uh, derived from gravity actually governs all chaotic systems. And if things, if history went this way, uh, then string theories would have been correct. Uh, we know uh, that hydrodynamics is universal. Uh, and uh, so this is a useful uh, method of discovery to keep in mind. And uh, this motivates some of my attempts in understanding better the butterfly effect and thermalization. So try to uh, isolate the relevant dynamical variables, try to write laws uh, that could apply uh, to any chaotic system and then boldly propose that they actually do apply to any chaotic system. Is there any question about this uh, introduction? If not, then um, this, uh, this example of hydrodynamics where I didn't say anything new uh, will just serve as, uh, as a motivation for what we are trying to do next. So I would start discussing uh, the butterfly effect in some detail. Uh, to put context around the main part of the talk, which will be about pause skipping. And uh, in, if time permits, in the end, I will give some comments on thermalization. And then I will end with a summary and open questions. OK, so all of us are familiar uh, with the butterfly effect in classical physics, which is the exponential sensitivity to initial data. And in recent years, uh, a lot of work has gone into, uh, into investigating what the quantum, quantum many-body generalization uh, should be um, in, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, it turns out that uh, the appropriate generalization is, that, um, is to look at uh, simple operators by which I mean, um, uh, a few body operators in uh, in uh, spin chains uh, and uh, low dimension operators in conformal field theory and uh, evolve them uh, with Heisenberg time evolution and watch them evolve into complex ones. Uh, the, this captures the intuition that the injection of one particle in the system at later times can have an effect in, on the entire system. Uh, just watching operators evolve is, uh, is too complicated for the human mind. Uh, we need a diagnostic, which is a number. And this diagnostic turns out to be the out of time ordered commutator. Um, so let me explain to you what motivates this. So we are interested in how the support of the operator V grows in time. So this is a local operator that we inserted at the origin. And we can uh, detect the support of this operator. So this operator grows in time and we want to detect where it has grown by taking its commutator with another local operator at the space-time point T and X. If this commutator, if the two operators commute, that means that the uh, operator V hasn't spread to that point. But if they do not commute and this uh, commutator is not zero, then we want to pick this signal up. Now, uh, the commutator of two Hermitian operators is anti-Hermitian, um, and but has an undetermined sign. So it makes sense to square this thing and put the minus sign to get a positive expression. This is still an operator. We want numbers. So we take the thermal expectation value of this quantity and normalize uh, with uh, the norms of V and W. And uh, this is a diagnostic of how uh, the operator V grows in time. If we write out, expand out the commutator, it will contain both time ordered and out of time ordered pieces. So the, by the out of time ordered piece, I mean uh, W of T, V zero, W T, V zero. It turns out that the out of time ordered pieces are the interesting ones. Um, okay, so why is this related to 
the classical black butterfly effect, you may ask. Um, it, if in semi-classical systems, if we take W uh, to be Q, uh, T, uh, and V uh, to be P at zero, and replace commutators uh, with uh, Poisson brackets, uh, then, then it turns out that C uh, becomes DQ, T, DQ at zero. And that's because the mo momentum is uh, uh, represented as a der as derivative with respect to uh, Q squared. So uh, in a semi-classical system, it, this would grow exponentially as uh, uh, with two lambda L, where by two lambda, then lambda L is this uh, classical Yapunov exponent. Okay, I, I'm I'm here assuming that you all of you have seen uh, one discussion of this uh, or or another. Uh, I'm, I'm my purpose is only to remind you of things, but if that's not the case, then please ask me questions. Okay, so let's look at how uh, this uh, OTOC uh, behave looks like in space time. So uh, here's a diagram. It vanishes exactly outside the light cone. And then it's inside the light cone, it starts small, but then it has a very, very sharp profile uh, in examples and it saturates uh, to its maximum possible value inside the cone region. This cone region is narrower than the light cone uh, and its slope determines the butterfly velocity. So the butterfly effect is, uh, we think of the butterfly effect as spreading ballistically with this velocity. Um, and, uh, okay. Um, it was found in ADS CFT calculations uh, that this OTOC uh, is uh, suppressed by one over n squared, uh, just like a four point function should be in, in holography, but it grows exponentially. Uh, in time and decays exponentially in space. This, is, this indeed defines a cone-like cone -like profile for the OTOC. And this result is valid in a hydro-like regime where we go to times and uh, distances a lot greater than beta, but a lot smaller than the scrambling time that you can simply see from here uh, when the exponential growth in time overcomes this one over n squared suppression and then the whole one over n expansion breaks down. So you shouldn't extrapolate this answer beyond times of log n um, when, when this expression becomes order one. Okay, so that's the holographic answer. Madasena Schenker Stanford showed that uh, this OTOC cannot grow faster than exponentially in any chaotic system. Um, and in systems where it starts small, it can, it, it can grow exponentially with a characteristic Yapunov exponent. And this Yapunov exponent uh, is famously bounded by two pi over beta, uh, establishing the result that um, black holes are the fastest uh, scramblers of quantum information. If you are interested in the growth of the OTOC, not just in time, but in space, uh, then, uh, then these authors proposed uh, that it makes sense to look at how it grows or, along uh, uh, rays of constant velocity. So here's a ray of constant velocity. V is that velocity. Uh, and um, if we look at this function of two variable uh, along such a ray, uh, then we get exponential growth with a velocity dependent Yapunov exponent that I will denote by lambda of v. Um, and with Sharoshi, uh, we showed that this lambda of v obeys a refined chaos bound, uh, which I'm writing here. And uh, which on this plot uh, is the dashed orange line. So it, count, it starts from the MSS uh, two pi over beta chaos bound and grows, goes down linearly and vanishes at the butterfly velocity, which determines where the uh, OTOC doesn't grow anymore. Uh, a remarkable feature of uh, this 
uh, lambda of v in generic systems is that while it starts out from a non-maximal value as a function of v at a certain critical velocity v that I denote by v star, it uh, reaches the bound and from then on uh, until the edge of the butterfly cone, it saturates uh, this refined chaos bound that we derived. Uh, and so in some sense, in the, in the sense of uh, velocity dependent uh, refinement of chaos, uh, many systems are maximally chaotic near the edge of the butterfly cone. Okay, how do I know that? Uh, so just to, uh, just to make one thing clear, uh, holography uh, would give you a, a, a linear velocity dependent Yapunov exponent uh, which saturates the bound for all values of V. Okay, so how do I know that uh, this is the generic behavior? Um, let me introduce the workhorse of this talk, uh, which is the SYK model. And here I will be using the spatially local generalization of the SYK model. So again, I'm assuming that everybody has seen uh, the SYK Hamiltonian that would be describing the physics of one of these uh, uh, white squares on my figure. I don't know why my pointer is not working, sorry. Okay. So uh, the Hamiltonian is, uh, is obtained as follows. Uh, we choose uh, all, all uh, groups of Q fermions uh, that are possible uh, and uh, multiply them with a random coefficient in the Hamiltonian that is drawn from a, an ensemble uh, which, is, uh, which has zero mean and uh, J squared variance. Okay, so then uh, to get the spatial local version of the SYK model, we put many SYK models next to each other. Uh, so far, they are not talking to each other. And then I add uh, the following uh, term to the Hamiltonian. I take Q over two fermions from one group uh, and then another Q over two from the nearest neighbor. And again, I create, uh, I, I give them a random coefficient and then add them to the Hamiltonian. This way, uh, I get the nearest neighbor Hamiltonian and on each lattice site, I, I have a separate SYK model. So in usual discussions, Q is chosen to be four, uh, but nothing changes if I change, uh, if I uh, increase Q, I mean, the, the same physics um, remains. Uh, but at large Q, uh, I have an enhanced uh, uh, solvability of, of this system. So let me just uh, sketch why that is. Um, so SYK is solvable because after averaging over disorder, you had a collective field description of it, uh, which is usually called the G sigma variables. Uh, and this uh, collective field uh, has an action uh, that has a n in front of it. And so you can use semi-classical methods like set of point approximation to solve it. So uh, this large Q limit of uh, this SYK chain uh, has the following effective uh, field or collective field description. It's a, it's a lo local Lagrangian in two times and the dynamical variable is this little g, uh, and the, there is one dynamical variable for each lattice site. Uh, it has a normal kinetic term uh, written in light cone coordinates uh, and the Liouville self interaction. And the different lattice sites are coupled again uh, through an exponential interaction. Uh, this is something reminiscent of Toda theory. But what is this little g in terms of SYK variables? So, uh, here are the SYK fermions. Uh, I form bilinears of them. That's where the two times come from. Average them over all fermion flavors. So this is an SYK expression. And uh, this uh, is equal to the free fermion propagator times a correction, one plus one over Q. And here, this is the definition of little g. You can derive this effective action by some Hubbard Stratonovich. Uh, so little g uh, is to be thought of as a fermion bilinear in the original SYK variables. Uh, 
And since this action uh, has a large coefficient, uh, we can find the saddle point that will give us the fermion propagator, as you can see from this equation. And uh, by uh, linearizing around this saddle point and determining the two point function in terms of little g variables, I can obtain the four point function of fermions. And this is what we uh, done uh, and independently Stryker has obtained the uh, same expressions uh, for one SYK uh, dot, uh, where we obtain a closed form expression for, for the four point function for all values of the temperature. Something I forgot to say is that SYK at finite Q is solvable in the low temperature, strongly coupled limit, whereas this large Q SYK is solvable for all temperatures and so for all couplings. The dimensionless coupling of this theory is usually called beta J, and I will conveniently instead use, uh, uh, I mean, just the redefinition of the coupling, uh, little g, which interpolates between zero and one. Zero is the free. Uh, limit, this is the high temperature limit, and uh, G goes to one is the low temperature maximally chaotic limit. So in summary, sorry, I, uh, it was a bit muddled. Uh, so the main point that you should take away from this slide is that this, mod this small modification of SYK allows us to uh, go away from the strongly coupled maximally chaotic uh, limit and still be able to solve this model. And this will give us a lot of mileage. Okay, so let me show you uh, how we obtain uh, the velocity dependent Yapunov exponent, lambda of v in this model. So going through all those steps that I mentioned, uh, for the growing piece of the four point function, we get the following simple expression. So P is just the spatial momentum and from every momentum mode, we get exponential growth, there's a plane wave part, and there's an important um, uh, denominator uh, that will play a role. Lambda of p uh, was determined in, in, in this recent work of ours. For all values of the coupling, it takes this form. So as we change g, we interpolate between a free and maximally chaotic theory. Now we are interested in the OTOC um, in the hydrodynamic regime. So for times uh, greater than uh, beta and a lot smaller than the scrambling time. And uh, there we can evaluate uh, this integral using saddle point. Uh, so, so here I'm already imagining that I set X equals V times T. So I have a, uh, just T to tune. For small V, uh, the saddle, uh, is on the imaginary axis. The original contour of integration was uh, on the real axis. We'd have to deform the contour into a steepest descent contour, pick up the saddle point value, uh, and we are happy. Uh, and lambda of phi that we are looking for turns out to be the Legendre transform of lambda of p, uh, which I wrote here explicitly. Okay, as I increase v, this saddle point goes upwards on uh, the imaginary axis and it may cross a pole. This pole is coming from this denominator uh, becoming zero. Uh, so namely lambda of P becoming one. Uh, and uh, so it's clear that if this is zero, then you get the pole. And if I, if so at V equals V star, the saddle crosses the pole. And uh, if we go for Vs that are bigger than V star, then the saddle is sitting here. If we want to deform the contour of integration uh, from the real axis to go through the saddle, uh, we necessarily pick up the pole contribution as well. And it turns out that the pole contribution always dominates. The pole uh, is accounting for the stress tensor contribution to chaos. And uh, uh, it, in this case, it always dominates uh, the answer. And so that's, that's the mechanism by which for V greater than V star, uh, we get some simple expression, some linear lambda of V, uh, which is coming solely from the stress tensor. So let, us, let me show you a, a concrete expression. Uh, so first let's look at relatively strong coupling. Uh, for V smaller than V star, you see a curving plot 
This is coming from the Lejeune transform. And after V uh, equals V star, we get just a linear dependence. And the butterfly velocity is determined by the stress tensor contribution to it. If we go to small coupling instead, we get a, a forever curving uh, uh, plot. So in that case, we are always in this situation. Um, and the butterfly velocity is smaller than what the stress tensor alone would give you. Okay. Similar results can be obtained for conformal field theories on hyperbolic space. Uh, this includes uh, 2D CFD at finite temperature, where the role of lambda of p is played by the leading regit trajectory, uh, where the regit trajectory is um, the spin of the operator as a function of its dimension, which is known uh, from integrability in n equals 4. If you analyze it, you see that for top coupling greater than 37.7, you are in such a situation, and below that, you are in this situation. Um, so in this case, uh, if you go with V between V star and VB, uh, then you are dominated by uh, the stress tensor, and you get in this refined sense of chaos, maximal chaos, whereas if you, if you are at small velocity, you still see that you are not maximally chaotic, only in only in the infinite top coupling limit do we get maximal chaos for all values of the velocity. Um, and it's a, an interesting direction is to try to write down an EFT uh, for this uh, OTOC, uh, which is understood in the case of strongly coupled SYK, when you, where you get the Schwarzian theory, uh, which is a time reparameterization pseudo Goldstone boson, and uh, which is the boundary graviton of the dual JT gravity. And what we are working on is to go away uh, from maximal chaos and, and uh, get an EFT uh, there. And our workhorse is this SYK model. Is there any question about this? If not, let me go on to discussing post skipping. Okay, I see I'm already halfway into the talk, but we needed this uh, introduction and uh, giving context uh, to be meaningfully discussed, uh, to meaningfully discuss post skipping away from maximal chaos. So let me recall from the hydro discussion that in the uh, retarded energy two point function, uh, we have a family of poles that uh, start their lives either as a sound or an energy diffusion mode. Um, now, in the strong decoupled limit of SYK, it was computed in the early papers that this uh, uh, correlation function takes the following form. So we get the formula that we wrote down in hydrodynamics. Um, Uh, with a small modification that in the numerator we have one plus omega squared. Of course, in hydro you would drop this omega squared piece, but here we want to go beyond hydro. Now you can see that uh, this family of poles uh, continues exactly quadratically forever, uh, but then, but uh, at omega equals i. Uh, we have that the residue of this pole vanishes. And uh, the corresponding p uh, is uh, i over square root of d. So some funny phenomenon is happening. Uh, this is what's called pole skipping. You have a family of poles, and as you go along that family of poles, at a special point, its residue is vanishing. In this case, this special point can be rewritten in terms of data of chaos. Um, I'm working with the uh, beta equals two pi. So in that, in these units, uh, sorry. Uh, lambda L is just one. So I can introduce that here. And uh, one over square root D is one over the butterfly velocity in this special model. Of course, this you could dismiss this as a silly rewriting, but it turns out that in ADS-CFT, you get the same phenomenon, namely that at this special, exactly at this special point, 
or skipping happens in the energy density two point function. Well, let me say a couple of words about how that comes about. So at the, as was shown in, uh, in these papers, um, at this special poor skipping point, one of the Einstein equations trivial, one component of the Einstein's equation uh, trivializes, and this leads to an ambiguity in the Green's function as computed from uh, uh, the ratio of the two different falloffs uh, of, uh, of the near, near boundary uh, behavior of the metric. So, I mean, uh, probably all of you know uh, that this is uh, to be interpreted as the source and this as a web, and this is how we compute uh, Green's functions in holography. So we have two independent falloffs near the boundary and they get tied together by uh, boundary conditions in the path. In this case, uh, in the case of retarded Green's function, the infalling boundary conditions on the horizon. Uh, the poles uh, come from the zero of, of this source term uh, corresponding to normalizable modes in the bulk. Um, and the zeros of the correlator come from the zeros of B. Uh, at the pause skipping point, uh, so one way of saying what happens in the pause skipping point is that the Einstein's equation trivializes. Another way of saying it is that uh, while in generic, for generic omega and P, we have one in falling mode uh, in, uh, at the pause skipping point, uh, both modes uh, uh, are in falling, and so you don't you have an ambiguity. You don't have a, uh, the boundary condition doesn't determine for you uh, what's going on. So, uh, in summary, um, okay. So the motivation for looking for this point. So why are we interested in this point? Is that uh, this OTOC that I talked about is a very complicated observable, and it would be nice to tease out data of chaos from something simpler. And indeed, these authors have found uh, that uh, in, there's a subtle, subtle signature of chaos in the energy density two-point function. Uh, something uh, funny, uh, namely this pole skipping behavior is happening at this special value. Uh, the residue of the hydropole vanishes at this special value of omega and p. Um, so this has been, uh, this phenomenon uh, has been tested as I, as I reviewed in ADS-CFT in the strongly coupled SYK chain and in stress tensor dominated CFTs on hyperbolic spaces. And it's also explained by the EFT for maximal chaos of Blakely Liu. With Choi and Sharoshi, we asked, what could be the non-maximal chaos generalization? Um, so from already from what I told you, we can make an educated guess. Uh, it is well known that the uh, stress tensor two point function is universal in CFT in flat space. And by a via transformation, we can make this into a thermal system living in hyperbolic space at some special temperature. This includes to the CFT at finite temperature on the, on the straight line. Um, we know that while this is universal for all CFTs, not all CFTs are maximally chaotic. For example, the free scalar has zero Yapunov exponent. We also saw in the previous section that the butterfly velocity in weakly coupled theories is generically smaller than what, what the stress tensor tells you uh, would be. So from all this, we came up with the proposal that the pole skipping point uh, should really happen at i times two pi over beta, one and one over the stress tensor contribution to the butterfly velocity. Um, just one, uh, just a couple of comments about uh, the pole skipping point. Um, so as I emphasize, this is outside the hydro regime. We are working with uh, uh, momenta and frequencies, which are order uh, temperature. Uh, whereas the hydro regime would be a lot smaller than temperature. And also we are working at analytically continued momenta, so imaginary momenta, whereas in uh, conventional physics, we take real momenta. And uh, this causes, uh, uh, this, this allows uh, a pole 
to be on the upper half plane, whereas for physical momenta, the poles of the Green's function have to be, retarded Green's function have to be on the lower half. Okay, so after these comments, so we have a, let, let me discuss uh, how we justify this proposal. Uh, uh, we will use our workhorse, the large QSYK chain, uh, to test this proposal, to pro provide very stringent, stringent test of it. Uh, so here's the proposal. Here's the collective field description of, S of the SYK chain that I introduced in the previous section. Uh, we have to find the saddle point and then uh, linearize this around this saddle point and determine the two point function in the little g variables, uh, which will give you the four point function in uh, the fermion variables. Okay. Uh, so don't be intimidated by this formula. I just want to uh, highlight uh, some aspects of it. So the linearization around the saddle point gives you a quantum mechanical problem, a simple particle moving a, in a partial Teller potential, uh, which is one over sine squared. Uh, and uh, the eigenvalue, uh, energy eigenvalue is related to the center of mass uh, Fourier mode in, in these two times, whereas theta is the difference of the two times. Uh, we can construct Green's functions of ODEs uh, by finding the zero modes of a homogeneous equation and then patching the zero mode. So it is a second order equation. There will be two zero modes. We patch them together uh, and then that introduces a kink and uh, this kink gives us the delta function in the Green's function. Okay, so what are the zero modes? One, if we uh, distinguish them by symmetry properties under reflection, we have an even and an odd zero mode, and both of them are, are some hypergeometric functions uh, of, of this uh, spatial variable theta. Uh, okay. So you, you don't have to remember the details. Um, now, why are we after a four-point function? After all, we want to compute the two-point two function of energy density. Uh, our, our way of, of extracting this is that we take the OP limit of two fermions colliding and extract the energy density, which is a, uh, which is a, um, a composite operator of, from fermions from this OP limit. If we go through these motions, um, we, we finally obtain uh, the Matsubara Green's function, the Euclidean Green's function, which at, which at even values of uh, the Matsubara frequency n uh, is uh, simply this um, even uh, I, zero mode that I, I is described here and taking its logarithmic derivative and evaluating it at some special value of theta. Whereas for odd values of n, we get the odd uh, odd zero mode uh, of this equation. So uh, this determines uh, in closed form uh, the value of the Euclidean Green's function. But we are after the retarded Green's function. Um, so how do we obtain the retarded Green's function? This is a very hard problem in complex analysis. Uh, we are given uh, a com an analytic function uh, on uh, at uh, at integer po values uh, on the imaginary axis, uh, and we are looking after the unique analytic continuation of this uh, that uh, decays uh, for uh, uh, for large omega away from the imaginary axis. Uh, there's a theorem called Carson's theorem, which says that such a continuation is unique, but it does not give you an algorithm how to construct it. Um, and here we are facing the following problem. We have a very different expression for even and odd uh, values of n, so it's unclear how to unify them and uh, then analytically continue in n. So uh, we spent quite a, uh, quite a bit of time uh, with this problem and eventually came up with a solution. So it turns out uh, that you have to take uh, the linear combination of these two zero modes in a way that for, for integer Matsubara frequencies, you recover these formulas. And to choose these coefficients such 
uh, that you get a well-behaved function on the whole complex plane. It turns out that uh, these uh, CE and CO coefficients uh, are ratios of four gamma functions times some hyper times some trigonometric functions, and uh, uh, it involved a lot of guesswork until we arrived at the final expression. But the final expression is very elegant. Uh, we just need to unify these two hypergeometric functions with these coefficients, and then uh, use the same formula, namely take the logarithmic derivative, evaluate it at a special point, and then uh, to get the retarded Green's function. Uh, we plug in n equals i omega plus epsilon. So we're coming from the upper half plane onto the real omega axis, just like uh, we usually do in thermal physics. And that gives us the retarded Green's function. Okay, so we have a closed form uh, retarded Green's function for all values of the coupling. And now we can test for skipping away from maximal chaos. Uh, we can do this analytically, but it's more fun in the talk uh, to show you some plots. Uh, so here I chose imaginary P, imaginary omega. Uh, the bright uh, colors are uh, indicating where the absolute value of the function is big, and the blue is where the function is small. And you can see uh, that we have a line of pause, which starts, uh, starts its life as a diffusion pole uh, intersecting with a line of zeros uh, exactly at the point where we predicted it. Here I zoomed in. You see the line of poles, line of zeros intersecting at this point. Uh, you can also see intricate behavior on the lower half plane with pole skipping points all over. Uh, we also analyzed this in the paper, but I won't discuss it any further. Uh, Having a, uh, having a- uh, um, Mark, uh, may I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. You, you write down this is interaction strength G is 0 0.6, but is this in the regime of maximal chaos or is this in the regime of non-maximal chaos? This is in the regime of non-maximal chaos. Only G cos one is maximal chaos. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, so- uh, so the large QSYK is great because we have this additional uh, uh, knob that we can tune and only in the G goes to one limit do we get maximal chaos. So it's like the TOF coupling in super young is. Um, okay, so, it so now that we have a, a closed form analytic expression uh, for the retarded two point function, we can also do what I uh, previewed in the uh, introduction, we can analyze dispersion relations of poles to all orders in derivatives. And uh, here I'm showing you three values of the couplings. Sorry, this uh, V is supposed to be G. Um, the first three poles, how, how they disperse. Uh, so this is the hydro, this is the hydro pole. Uh, at different couplings, and uh, you can see that it collides with a non hydropole at some value of p. And uh, following these uh, very interesting papers, we can analyze the convergence radius of hydrodynamics uh, and, and so on uh, by having this explicit expression. So let's take stock uh, what we have achieved. Uh, and uh, nowadays, if you uh, don't have an opinion, you can go on Twitter and go away with an opinion. So let's let's do that. Uh, okay, it starts good. It says this paper today is brilliant. Okay, uh, so as far as we know, this is the only expression of its kind. We usually are stuck at weak coupling or extremely strong coupling if we use holography. Very happy to learn that we can interpolate between the two, even in this dirty finite D setting. Uh, so I, so to summarize, uh, I I think that this formula uh, can, uh, besides the applications I've al already shown you, I think it's worth uh, uh, thinking more about what one can do with with such a, a formula. Uh, and uh, probably we haven't extracting all the physics that it that is there in, in this uh, uh, in this Green's function. Okay, so let me summarize. Uh, what I talked about so far. Uh, so after hydro, we talked about the velocity dependent Yapunov exponent lambda of v. Uh, 
as uh, and we I showed you that that strong coupling typically we get a graph like this that weak coupling we get this graph like this and the uh, lambda of v obeys a refined chaos bound um, we discussed some explicit examples mostly in SYK but also in holography um, then we proposed uh, a pole skipping point where the pole skipping phenomenon should happen uh, away from maximal chaos. So pole skipping still happens, but it it happens at, at this point. Um, we don't have a proof of this away from maximal chaos. We just have one strong example, which uh, proves the consistency of this proposal. So the pole skipping point captures the stress tensor contribution of, to chaos which for uh, velocities between V star and V B uh, indeed controls chaos. Um, but uh, let me emphasize uh, that uh, just, for, just having for skipping does not um, lead to, uh, or does not, is not a good uh, signature of chaos because the contribution of the stress tensor to chaos can be decreased by other contribution or even completely cancelled in the case of the free scalar. Uh, I think uh, our work demystifies pole skipping. Uh, since uh, the energy density two-point function and the stress tensor contribution to the butterfly velocity are both properties of the stress tensor, it's not so surprising that, that they can show up in the same formula. But the stress tensor alone does not know about uh, the Yapunov exponent. And so it cannot be that the Yapunov exponent shows up in a post skipping formula. And it, in, indeed, it does not. And as I emphasize, we have a closed form thermal Green's function that uh, allows us to demonstrate many uh, interesting phenomena. And probably there are some things to uncover. OK, in the remaining. Uh, Ten minutes. If I, uh, if I, do, uh, yeah. can I ask a clarification yeah. about the statement on the previous slide? Yeah. So lambda l here for you is two pi over beta, and your your bullet point about demystifying pole skipping. By this you mean that omega p s is lambda l and not lambda v, and lambda v is the Lyapunov no, yeah. exponent. Okay. Yeah. So. So lambda, so just to be so lambda l, which is conventionally called the Yapunov exponent in in the literature, is lambda at v equals zero in in my notation, and uh, I'm saying that uh, the omega at the pole skipping point is simply two pi over beta, uh, which has nothing to do, which in general is not equal to lambda l. Okay, thank uh, you. At maximal chaos, it's of course equal to lambda L, but it, it's not very informative because that if we know that we are at maximal chaos, we already know the Yapunov exponent. Okay. Thank what you. is important? What is interesting? So, what is a diagnostic of chaos here is that this butterfly velocity uh, from the stress tensor is indeed something that that is a non-trivial. Uh, uh, has no trivial dependence on what on what theory we are looking at, and uh, and that that's uh, that's indeed a data of chaos. Whereas I wouldn't I would say that two pi over beta is not a data of chaos. In the case of maximal chaos, of course it is, but uh, in general it is not. Or you can say that it's the stress tensor contribution uh, to uh, to the Yapunov exponent. So you can uh, I guess you could say that this guy is lambda L of the stress tensor. That would be a correct thing. And in that sense, uh, pole skipping is, is giving you the stress tensor contribution to chaos. But unfortunately, these contributions don't add up. Uh, they can be decreased or completely cast. Thanks for the question. Um, OK, so in the remaining uh, nine minutes, uh, let me just can very quickly brief comment that yeah. uh, uh, the, the, the computation is beautiful, and um, the statement that VB sits in the stress tensor is very nice. But in, in weakly coupled theories that are perturbatively described by the Boltzmann equation, okay. we know that the energy, uh, energy correlation function actually knows very well 
about lambda L also after an analytic continuation. So the the so, so are you are the stress tensor does not know about the Lyapunov exponent is is explicitly not so in any weakly coupled theory. So I think the the interpretation about demystifying I would say actually it mystifies pull skipping even more because by your own introduction it's a very natural in objects that are maximally chaotic precisely with lambda L is two pi over beta, but the fact that you now have an example which shows that this is also the case when you're not have maximum, it makes it actually rather mystifying. So I, my I, guess at the beginning would have been is that the moment you go away from max case, you will not find pull skipping. So I'm, I'm, it is beautiful, but I would say it makes it more mysterious. So are you, just, just to clarify what you're saying, maybe, maybe I should have looked at the, uh, your work uh, more. So are you saying that in, in kinetic theory, uh, pull skipping happens at the, at the value of the Yapunov exponent? No, 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 there's no, no. pull skipping as far as we know. I mean, this is still, still an open question. There's no pull skipping that we know that happens in uh, weakly coupled theories. Nevertheless, from the stress tensor, well, that, not directly from the stress tensor correlation function, but from the Schwinger Dyson equation that determines the stress energy co correlation function, I can extract the Lyapunov exponent from you. I understand. I understand. Okay. Uh, I don't have anything to say on this because I haven't looked at this literature, but I would be very happy to, uh, to uh, discuss it afterwards. Um, okay. So, so then uh, if we incorporate Conrad's remark, then, then I, I guess what he's saying is that uh, there are still some mysteries and there are some examples where this where this relation, where our proposal does not seem to be true. Uh, okay. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. My guess would have been that it would not be true. So the fact that you have a, an example is fantastic. Okay, great. But, but you're okay. But his point is that the stress tensor knows about uh, the Yapunov exponent in, weekly, in, in his weekly coupled example. Okay, that's yeah. a very, very nice point. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, so uh, very good that we have a discussion. Um, uh, so I'll just very rush through this uh, this part of the talk. I didn't plan to spend too much time on it. Um, all I'm saying is that uh, one uh, nice setup where you can uh, study uh, chaotic dynamics, uh, which is distinct from what we have been discussing, is is uh, very much out of equilibrium, where we start from. A, out of equilibrium initial state and uh, study how it thermalizes. And we can probe this uh, with entanglement entropy, uh, which probably most of you are familiar with. Uh, so we take a geometric subregion uh, and that provides coarse graining. And we can watch how the entropy evolves from a low value in an out of equilibrium uh, sparsely entangled initial state to the thermal value. And there is a hydrodynamic regime that is worth uh, uh, talk, spending some time with. Uh, so here, here's a sketch uh, uh, in space-time, the purple plane. Um, why is my pointer not working? Okay, anyway, so this, this plane represents the uh, initial state. And then uh, we are interested in the entropy at some later time. Uh, so this gray, uh, plane is a time slice. Uh, this is the subregion with linear size r. And we take both the time and this size r to be fixed and large, a uh, lot larger than, uh, than the local equilibration time, which we said is order beta in strongly coupled system. Uh, and so this is a hydro-like limit. Uh, in this limit, uh, the entropy is expected to uh, be uh, more universal than away from this limit. Uh, it has uh, an extensive prefactor times a scaling function that only depends on the ratio of time with R. So this is the leading piece. There are subleading pieces. Uh, T over R is what we keep fixed in this limit. Okay, uh, from these very nice works, 
uh, we understand the qualitative picture of what should be happening at early times. We have a long, parametrically long uh, regime of linear growth. Then at some finite time, we saturate to the thermal value. Uh, the increase of entanglement entropy in itself does not detect chaos, just like in pulse skipping, but it's the uh, dynamics uh, is universal in chaotic systems and, uh, and uh, we can learn a lot. Now, uh, I've done a lot of work on this topic in this hydrodynamic limit. Uh, one can determine uh, an effective theory uh, just like hydrodynamics for this process. Um, and this effective uh, theory uh, can be derived both from holography and in, in the condensed matter literature, it was derived from random quantum circuits. So uh, there's a remarkable unification between condensed matter and high energy approaches since they lead to the same effective description. Uh, in this alternative history, uh, thinking about uh, this problem, uh, this would be considered a very strong indication that this is indeed universal for all chaotic theories. I don't have time to explain to you what this, um, what this effective theory is. I'll just show you one of its predictions uh, that for uh, spherical mm -hmm. regions. Mark, uh, sorry, just let yeah. me tell you that. I mean, take it easy with time. I mean, you don't have to. Uh, sure, but I. Okay. Anyway, I was planning not to go into too much detail. If people want, in the end, I and ask about it, I can explain what. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. I just that. yeah. Thank so you very much. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I'm just emphasizing that uh, okay, you can so you can derive the entropy evolution from this effective theory. Uh, you get this red line for a spherical region, uh, and you get saturation at the value. R is the radius of the sphere uh, divided by the butterfly velocity. So what, why, the reason why I included this part uh, in the talk is to show that the butterfly velocity shows up in entropy dynamics as well. Um, and uh, in, with Stanford, we gave very general arguments that the saturation time has to be greater than R over VB in any uh, consistent quantum system. And so this saturation, which actually doesn't just happen for spheres, it also happens for elongated shapes, uh, which we showed it with Van der Schie, uh, leads to the result that black holes are not only uh, fast scramble scramblers in, in the sense of OTOC, they also saturate entanglement entropy the fastest possible in quantum mechanics. So that's another task that they excel in. Okay. Um, Great. There's an interplay between this effective field theory and hydro, which is way beyond what I can discuss today. So let me summarize and go, end with some open questions. So we started with discussing hydro as an EFT, as an, uh, as an aspiration. Like if we could achieve that level of understanding for the other phenomena, we would be extremely happy. Um, but we also needed it because it has non-trivial interplay with uh, Paul Skipping. Um, and also with entanglement dynamics. And then we went on to discuss the butterfly effect and to understand what this butterfly velocity really is. And uh, I showed you uh, um, a refined chaos bound. Uh, then uh, we uh, proposed uh, this uh, uh, post skipping, that post skipping happens uh, in, in the energy density retarded Green's function at this value, which should be thought of as the stress tensor contribution to chaos. So uh, I, maybe I should have said that this is the stress tensor contribution to, um, to the Yapunov exponent. And uh, finally, I mentioned some, some results about entropy dynamics, uh, which is another chaotic phenomenon. I did not talk about other signatures, for example, the statistics of eigenvalues. It would be really fascinating to relate uh, uh, all these uh, phenomena together. Uh, so just to uh, re-emphasize the role of the butterfly velocity, um, the butterfly velocity delineates the region where the OTOC grows and where it saturates from the region where it stays small. Um, and the is often uh, determined by just the stress tensor alone. Uh, 
and uh, it shows up in, in both skipping uh, and uh, the butterfly velocity also shows up in, in entropy dynamics. Uh, and one uh, clear signature of it is in the saturation time. Okay, so some open questions and uh, we'll end here. Uh, so it, one, one question that excites me is uh, whether we can work out an EFT for, operate, for OTOCs. Uh, this was already done in the strongly coupled limit of the SYK model uh, where it's the Schwarzian, uh, but we want to understand it away from maximal chaos, uh, which would in the holographic dual correspond to some stringy gravity. Um, then, um, okay, this is, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, more ambitiously, we would like to get an EFT uh, for all these phenomena, uh, and and the regime of validity should be in some kind of hydro regime where things are more universal than away from it. Uh, Blakely Liu in the maximal chaos case have managed to unify post skipping with OTOCs, but this remains to be done. Uh, in, away from maximal chaos and, and entanglement dynamics should be uh, should be part of the story. Okay, these are open. Okay, I'll just leave these questions because the others are about entropy dynamics and I didn't talk much about it. So with this, I would like to uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Mark. Very nice. Very nice. <clears throat> we had some questions, but. Here, of course, we always have time for questions and discussion. So, Hi, can I ask a question? Of course. Hi, Mark. Thanks for the talk. Um, you may have already answered this, and I missed it. So sorry if you did. But could you say a bit more about this this stress tensor contribution to the butterfly velocity? Uh -huh. Is this kind of yours? Is this coming from calculating certain diagrams and the four point function, or what exactly? No. Yeah. So very good. So in well, you you are you are pointing out correctly that it's a little bit of stretch uh, to. I mean, it would be nice to understand this better. So, what what I really mean by this is that there is a po in like in formulas. So we had this expression, and uh, I attribute the existence of this pole to the stress tensor. And uh, it's the data of this pole uh, that where from which you can read off the this this uh, quantity VBT and uh, and see that if you just have that pole, uh, then uh, what you get is uh, is a, a linear country. So you have this pole above V star, and you get. Uh, a linear contribution to lambda v, and if you extrapolate it back to v equals zero, then it would be at two pi over beta. Um, so this is what I. Okay, so where where how do I know that this is actually coming from the stress tensor? And the, in the SYK context, I cannot give you a very convincing argument. In the case of conformal field theory or conformal Regi theory, it's extremely clear. That uh, so the structure of the of uh, of the OTOC is the same uh, in 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 CFTs in hyperbolic space, uh, and there we really know that this pole is uh, coming from the stress tensor. So there's a special contribution from the stress tensor, and it it's it is what causes uh, uh, causes this pole. So that's my answer. That. Uh, we understand where the pole is coming from in conformal field theory, uh, and we see the same pole in SYK, so we think that it's the stress tensor. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Risa. Any more questions? <clears throat> Comments? Uh, sorry, David. Daniel, I have a question. Yes, uh, hi, Mark. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question about shift symmetry. Uh, what can we say about the relation between shift symmetry introduced by uh, Blake Liliu and 
your very interesting example away from maximal chaos regime? That's a very good, there... yeah, that's a very good question. So, so Navid's question is that uh, Blakely Leo have uh, have a shift symmetry in their um, EFT that uh, is used to ban uh, or or get get away from exponential growth in time ordered correlators. Uh, so that's that's kind of that's what protects uh, uh, time ordered correlators from exponential growth, which they shouldn't exhibit. Uh, since we do not have an EFT uh, in away from maximal chaos at the moment, we do not know what replaces that shift symmetry. But one one thing that so it's in the literature in the published literature it is not said that Blakely Liu only apply, applies to maximal chaos, but in unpublished work that was shown by uh, Blake and Liu that their framework only works for maximal chaos. Um, so uh, we do not know what's the appropriate generalization. And here I commented that um, that we are working on on trying to get such a generalization. And uh, our workhorse again is the SYK model, where we have uh, where we can go away from maximal chaos and have an explicit four point function to reproduce. So we're trying to guess what the EFT would be. Thank you. Any more questions for Mark? Okay, if not, well, anyway, I will stop the recording and in the meantime, people can still decide to ask questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank maybe, you. maybe without recording there. <laughs>